they were very different. I'll, I'll talk about both of them in this way, that civil, I came up from the inside. So I came on right after the pilot on civil and um, was sort of the number four person on staff, the number three person the next year, and then Chuck and his number two got fired and I was elevated. So I, I went from one day being one of the menches in the trenches to the second, you know, the next day having all of that responsibility. Whereas Foxworthy, uh, when I quit Civil, I got offered that and just went across the lot and came into, you know, something that was already rolling where I had, you know, very peripheral relationships with a couple of the people, including Jeff Foxworthy himself, who had guessed it on Civil. But it's a very different thing coming up from the inside um, and, and trying to keep something that it's broken, you know, personally broken. It wasn't creatively broken, but there was a lot of bad blood in every direction. And, and that was the big thing that needed to be fixed. Um, and keep, keep a level of quality and, and hopefully improve on the level that was there. Whereas Foxworthy, it was, it, it was, a, it was creatively broken. They really hadn't figured out what to do with that show. And so, um, you know, I, I had, in that case, then you have all of the staffing things, right? You have, because on the one, on Sybil, I, yes, I was one of the mentions in the trenches, but the other were really good. I had this terrific team of writers and it was just about finding some more to, to fill us out. Foxworthy, you walk in and you don't really know what anybody can do. And so, you know, are people gonna leave, can, you know, who, who, who are you going to keep? Which of the cast are you going to keep? How do you refashion? In, in the case of that one, there was a big tension between uh, us and the network, a small tension, I'll say, over whether the show should focus more on his home life or on the loading dock where he worked. And they like the idea of a domestic comedy, but clearly our funny money was at work. And so we kept sort of trying to blend them or, or tilt it that way. So I was the head writer, uh, you know, a showrunner, head writer. So, so everything, it's funny, everything sort of filters through you. And, and there, there, there are so many different ways of running shows. And you mentioned Chuck. Chuck, Chuck almost needs to be in the room when something is written or he doesn't trust it somehow. Or that was my experience with him then with as many shows as he ended up having. I don't know if he was able to, to loosen that up and find people he could trust that way. Um, to the point that we had great episode writers, he didn't even like them going off and writing episodes. That it, it, it all sort of got room written. My um, MO was really much more to let everybody do what they could do best and give them as much room to do it as they could. And ultimately it had to be filtered through my sensibility and I would be there running the rewrite room all the time. Uh, but I really wanted to make it more inclusive and in a way that uh, to me, it's, it's more fun for the other people. You get the best of their work uh, and you end up with a better product in, in, in my sense of it. Uh, Foxworthy was fantastic. I came in in the middle of an episode. <laughs> Like we were shooting an episode and I would have to lean over to the director before I'd give a note and say, if I have him change this line or change this attitude, is that gonna mess up the rest of the show? <laughs> Cause I hadn't even had time to read it yet. We were shooting in front of the audience. And then the next day we had a table read in the morning of an episode that a couple of outgoing writers had worked their butts off to, to, to just give us something to work with. And I led off the table read with the network and the studio and all that by saying, just don't worry about this. We're going to be doing a lot of work on it. These guys did a great job to get us to here. And, I, and we did that. And then I said to Jeff, so go home, chill out. There's no point even rehearsing this. We're going to change it so much. Um, and he said, what do you mean? I want to stay here and help. And he rolled up his sleeves and he and I were in the room together. And for the rest of that run, he would come in one night a week and pitch jokes and just figured I'm, you know, I'm a funny guy, let me add to this. And by working harder, I loved him, loved working with him. You know, coming into home improvement specifically, I was only on that one year and in a, a part-time kind of way, um, but I guess it's the biggest show that I worked on. So it's a, a natural one to, to ask about, but it was also the only one that I came into not at the very beginning. 
So they already had something of the format, um, but they were trying to find their way. I'll tell you a story from that. They, they felt that they were bringing me in. They brought, specifically, they said, we want this to have a little bit more sophistication to it. Be a little more um, adult in some way. And all of the episodes, they were very clear in a good way. They were very clear. They knew what the show was. It was about a man's point of view and a woman's point of view and, and put them in conflict. And they had, you know, Pat Richards and Patricia Richards is a great actress and Tim who was, you know, did what he did very, very well. Um, and I came in and pitched an episode where a, a friend of theirs, there's a couple, they come by the house, the man's out in the garage messing with the car with Tim and says, um, if, if my wife asks, you and I were having lunch on Thursday together. So in other words, asking Tim to cover for, um, to cover for an affair that he was having. And the guys loved it when I pitched it and we did the episode. And then after, I, mean, I shouldn't be telling the story, but I am. Um, after it, it, we, we shot it, they came into work the next week and it was as if I had foisted porn on them. <laughs> You know, that, that this it was such a wholesome show and that was such a not wholesome, um, you know, story. So then for my second and, and final episode that I wrote for them, I pitched something just, you know, just down the middle. Like I, at this point, understood what the show was. And I said, okay, Jill is going to take their son, Randy, to the ballet and uh, she all of a sudden has, gets called into work that day and asked Tim to take him instead. And then Tim finds out he has tickets for the Pistons game and lies and blows off the ballet and takes his son to the Pistons. And Charles Barkley falls on him and breaks his arm. <laughs> Excuse me. And I was proud when the show wrapped, um, the LA Times did a sort of valedictory piece on it and pointed to that as the quintessential home improvement episode. So there's my story about coming in to a culture, trying to bring something else, not getting it, not fitting, but, but learning and adapting. I love it. <laughs> I really, really love it. It, you know, the, the joy and the frustration of, of a life in theater and movie and TVs and TV is, is that you're working with other people, right? Um, it, it's a joy because I love the collaboration. I, I, I really do. When you're making something and you're with good people and, and that's terrific, but you're, this ties back into what we talked to, uh, talked about with the money. You, you're, you're always at the mercy of your financers and sometimes of, of less able collaborators and big egos, and you often end up with a product, if you end up with a product at all, right? Because I spent way too much of my career in development of things which didn't get made or helping on things which did get made, but I was really just a helper and, and, and didn't get much credit, if any. Uh, and then things that get made that you wish hadn't. <laughs> You know, here's something where it's it's all on you, and uh, and that's that's great. I just I love the responsibility of it, and uh, and it's 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 a wonderful feeling when people connect with it because I think because it is so so much you, and because the the experience of reading is so intimate, it's such a connection. I never got mail for things that I worked on. You know, on Home Improvement, the show would get letters, you know, and, and I mean, that was such a, a, a big thing. And, and obviously there, you know, people write about things on, on, online now and, you know, any, anything that's out there in the world, people have opinions on. But, you know, we're encouraged to have these websites with a contact spot. And every time a new book comes out and there's a little, you know, flurry or, or sometimes more than a flurry of, of new readers who are connecting with it in such a personal way. It's, it's beautiful. It was um, Walden. It was Thoreau in the woods. 
And I, I was originally going to call it Waldo's Woods, you know, rather than Walden's Woods. And, and so, uh, you know, and, and, and I thought Waldo was a cool last name. It's sort of a nerdy first name. And I said, that wasn't right. But, and then just Charlie Waldo just fit right, just sounded right. I have a really peculiar process too, I, I gather. It's not totally peculiar, it's just extreme. I, I, it takes me almost a year to write one of these. And I spend half of that time outlining. So I, it takes me, a, I, I figure it out and I get to where I have, the books all seem to land between 70, 75,000 words. The outlines run around 30,000. So 40% um, of, of, so it, it has everything figured out except the language. And then it's that and doing it over and over and over. But I have to tell you, uh, you know, living in Charlie Waldo's head, it's really confining. I mean, you know, this guy who is so, so strict, you know, to, that, that his way of, I mean, it's, it's the idea of the character, right? His way of going forward into the world when he's done this horrible wrong to somebody, uh, which is what it's about, is is to only allow himself the hundred things. It's to never eat anything that had any packaging. It's to never, it's to, to get around self-propelled. He rides around on a bike, you know, or, or walks um, unless somebody is already riding or take public transportation or ride in a car when somebody else was going there anyway. So it's, it, and, and even like that last one was sort of, a moment of rationalization, right? Or, 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 or wrapping his mind around, can I make an exception here? So every move he makes, every time he gets hungry, every time he has to go across town, there are, it's, it's so confining and, and, and based around this self-punishment that I, I, I do find it, I, I just find it very cramping. I feel it emotionally cramping. And when I'm Finished with a book, I feel this great relief that I could just, you know, be Howie out in the world again. I wasn't planning to say anything about this, but what the heck? So two things. One is it takes place in the early days of the pandemic. And uh, Alistair, the, the character from the first book, who was played by Mel Gibson in the movie, is back in the next book. I'm I'm kind of winging it. Uh, this this is also something I've never talked about. I wrote another novel, a, a, a standalone sort of uh, corruption crime satire in Washington, DC, <laughs> and gave it to my agent. And he said, you know, politics right now is all Trump. And there's probably no room for like normal, <laughs> normal corruption. Um, so let's sit on this one for a while. So uh, I, I mean, I, I, I enjoy it. I think we'll just keep taking it a step at a time.